Anyway, uh, so uh, the second topic that people voted for uh, was no sequel, and in fact, a number of people uh, kind of specifically requested this. Um, it's not a topic I really uh, wanted to present, but kind of digging deeper into it, something occurred to me. No sequel kind of manifests my core mantra. Uh, no sequel is is kind of the uh, the epitome of the it depends approach to managing data, uh, and in particular, managing big data. Um, so I'll try and get across to you kind of what that means. And to, to start that, I'd like to you know, start from why people started saying no SQL, SQL is bad, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, Kind of all of this got started with this observation that uh, what typically is referred to as the relational model, um, more particularly specific implementations of the relational model, uh, were kind of very heavy weight. Uh, there are a lot of limitations. Uh, it assumes a very specific uh, structure to your data, uh, column value, uh, these, these column value structures. Uh, and moreover, it, it assumes that that structure stays fairly consistent throughout the, the course of uh, forever. Um, and on top of that, it kind of forces you to keep your data in that structure. So if, let's say, you have log files or uh, graph data or um, some kind of hierarchical data structures, you basically have to have uh, some sort of mapping between that data into this fixed relational model. And while it's certainly possible to do so, and a number of uh, well, people have been doing this for, for decades now, uh, it makes things a little bit harder to use. So kind of the, the first motivating factor for, for this NoSQL movement has been this uh, fixation on the relation, by the database community on the relational model. As, as kind of your core primitive. Uh, the other kind of major gripe that you encounter is this observation that uh, every single SQL database to date has basically tried to do everything, uh, from the indexing, to the querying, to the data layout, to basically everything from the moment that the data arrives in the system uh, to the moment that the data gets used. Every stage in the process involves the database. Now, this kind of monolithic behavior is, well, it can be very nice. It, uh, well, it's this one common interface that you use, that every single part of your system uses. Uh, the, the user connects to it, all of your devices connect to it, uh, your, your browser front ends uh, connect to basically everything that you do uh, goes through this single centralized infrastructure. And to some degree, that means you can build a system very easily. Once, once you install the database, uh, you can kind of use that to spin up new tasks very, very quickly. It's also a very nice thing that you can just keep in your pocket, a little, little device that does a little bit of everything. Um, if you need a knife, it's got a knife. If you need a corkscrew, it's got a corkscrew. Tweezers, everything is in there. The problem is that when you start uh, looking at the, the features that you need and the features that it provides, well, kind of want to add more features and more features and more features. And eventually you end up with an infrastructure that tries to, su uh, that tries to address every single problem, every single data management problem that you could think of, and well, you get that. Um, I don't know about you, but I don't think I, those pliers would be particularly useful if I wanted to use them. Um, so this, this is kind of th this idea that one database system, one infrastructure can solve all of your problems uh, is a bit of a, a misnomer. Um, so kind of the, the epitome or the, the rallying call of uh, the NoSQL movement has been this paper by uh, a guy named Michael Stonebreaker uh, whose name will pop up all over the place as you start looking into this. Um, so he's a very, uh, very outspoken person, uh, very strong on the database side, uh, but 
kind of he wrote uh, he and a bunch of uh, his colleagues wrote a paper called the end of an architectural era it, in parentheses it's time for a complete rewrite uh, where they observe that most large-scale relational databases uh, are try and do everything and as a consequence of that they can't do anything quite as efficiently as as they potentially could now one kind of uh, illustrate this through images a little bit more let's say that you have a piece of paper and you want to create a nice little cutout drawing well if I happen to have a, a Swiss Army knife I could probably do that do it with that nice pair of scissors cut have to be more creative than I am but uh, basically if, if you know what you're doing you can probably pull something like that off but now kind of take that to an extreme. Let's say you, you have a big field of grass. Completely different problem. You have a big field of grass and you want to cut that. Well, you could potentially use, you could still use your, your little Swiss Army knife and you know, trim every single leaf, but you're not going to do that. You're, you're going to bring out a lawnmower. Um, so, again, kind of getting back to it, the, the NoSQL movement is, is kind of this observation that rather than starting from this one database that tries to do everything but doesn't do it particularly well, what they're going to do is instead give you some tools, uh, give you some building blocks that you can build everything up. And then uh, whatever it is that you need, you can take those tools and put them together in just the right way and get precisely what you're looking for. So, uh, kind of the, the goal of this lecture is going to be uh, twofold, uh, sorry, threefold. Um, I'm going to start by kind of describing some of the challenges, some of the uh, things that you need to watch out for when designing a database system. Um, many of you have already encountered a number of these, uh, and some of them are going to be things that are operating at a larger scale. Uh, the second general goal for today is going to be to talk about a couple of paradigms. Now this is kind of backing away from NoSQL as a uh, concept in and of itself, but there are a couple of paradigms that you should be familiar with if you try and use MySQL in any way, shape, or form. And then finally I'm going to uh, kind of discuss uh, a handful of different uh, MySQL system, or sorry, NoSQL systems and uh, kind of try and relate them to one another, discuss their pros and cons, say what's cool about them, what's not so cool. So, okay, with that, uh, before I dive into this, are there any questions? All right. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, since I completely forgot, forgot about this, um, uh, Shunak will be here towards the end of class with your assignment sixes, so um, now that people are here, uh, pick them up after class. All right, so let me start, uh, let me start today by discussing uh, what exactly are the design considerations that go into a NoSQL database. Now, I'm starting from this point for two reasons. First off, uh, it's a good thing to know. These are con design considerations that uh, you'll probably encounter if you do any kind of uh, design, database design at all. Uh, but kind of like we talked about the internals of a database so that you knew how to use it better, same thing here. Uh, knowing what the trade-offs are in the design of a database will kind of help to uh, help you to uh, assess what the qualities are of a database that you're looking for. And when you actually try and use one of these NoSQL systems, that'll be a starting point to, uh, to, to kind of prune down this huge space of, of database systems that are out there, NoSQL database systems that are out, out, out there. So to start, um, I'm going to start with some observations made by uh, Stonebreaker and uh, his colleagues in this uh, paper that basically boil down to one observation. A traditional relational database, one-size-fits-all database, has lots and lots of functionality, lots of things uh, that it tries to do, and this paper identifies six of them that kind of add to, to the latency, add, uh, reduce the performance 
but at the same time don't necessarily provide functionality that a database uh, necessarily requires. So let me get into it. And the first is one that we've just talked about, this, observa this uh, concept of logging, both uh, for redo and for undo. Now the observation is that both undo and redo are features that are not strictly speaking required. But at the same time, I'm sure many of you noticed that you need to, uh, in order to make use of a log, in order uh, both a redo and an undo log, you need to flush the log to disk before you can do anything with the database. Now that's a huge performance hit. How long is a, is a database, uh, sorry, is a, a disk write? Anyone remember this from way back in the... What order, yeah? 20 milliseconds, that sounds about reasonable. That's 20 milliseconds on every single operation that you need to do. That is pretty atrocious. So what if the application doesn't need that functionality? What if the does application doesn't care uh, that the, the data that it writes needs to be durable? What if it doesn't care that the, uh, the um, what if the semantics simply dictate that every single write, every single object that gets written is going to be atomically uh, modified and you don't, you don't really care about the order in which they're written? Similarly, for undos, maybe the application never goes back to a previous state. Maybe you just don't care about that. So why are we doing this? Okay, next thing. In analyzing most of these database infrastructures, they found that there was a huge overhead coming from the client talking to the database. Keeping these as two separate entities is, well, there's overheads there. And what kind of overheads? So what do you need to do to process a SQL query? What's the very first thing that you need to do? You need to parse the query. OK, you've parsed the query. What's next? OK, then you need to access all of the schema information and then do what with the query? You, you've parsed it into a, a select statement and uh, some kind of structure. What do you do with the query itself? Remember? Uh, Remember that uh, kind of diagram with the, the stages of compilation? Optimization. So I have this query, I then need to optimize it. I need to, this whole process going from string to uh, compiled query to uh, optimized query, that takes time. And add to that the fact that these uh, Queries are typically coming in from an external source, from something outside of the, the database's namespace. That adds even more time. Um, usually these, uh, the way you connect to a database is through some sort of TCP socket. Just the TCP socket is going to add, uh, again, on the order of milliseconds to your, uh, to your time. And all of this basically makes for a uh, much slower response time. So the observation here is that, well, can you put, take some of this application logic and push it into the database? OK, that's uh, redo logs, undo logs, and, uh, and uh, what should we call it? And uh, the, the connect, uh, connectivity. Locking. Another observation is that locking is frequently unnecessary. And by trying to do everything at once, the database is, well, it's trying to do everything at once. It doesn't necessarily know uh, the precise semantics of the application that's running on it. And that means that it has to take the most general approach possible. And that usually means uh, particularly where locking is concerned, that it has to very aggressively lock things that don't need to be locked. Let's avoid this. 
Now that also applies to smaller, tiny data structures. An index, for example, if I want to access an index or write to an index in a traditional database, I'm going to have to acquire a lock on that index. Now these kind of smaller, narrower uh, locks are often called latches. And the observation is that we can, if we design our database the right way, ideally no more than one thread is going to be accessing any of these given data structures at a given time. So we, if we can offload all of the, the index maintenance work to a separate thread, um, or more generally, the, we, if we design our databases in kind of a shared nothing uh, view, kind of like we talked about a couple of lectures ago, we can get much better performance because locking adds just these huge overheads. All right, and the last thing that was observed uh, is, or the last major overhead that they observed was from two-phase commit. And we just went over this. How many round trips? Oh, come on, I know someone can read. It is up there, right? Oh, it's not, maybe not. It was in an earlier draft. So, how many round trips do I need for two-phase commit? How many messages get sent? Yeah, uh, two-phase commit. Uh, if I have two different, uh, two different nodes and I want them to uh, agree on some, or come to con three messages. So the, uh, the coordinator sends a message to the client, the client sends a message to the coordinator, coordinator sends a message to the client. That's basically one and a half, or let's round up, two round trips. That's pretty crazy. Uh, again, we're adding on the order of tens or even hundreds of milliseconds to our response time. Now, just to give you some sense of scale here, uh, there are applications, um, advertising services in particular, that require ridiculously tiny round trip latencies. As a general observation, that if uh, that users tend to get very annoyed uh, if the page load uh, takes more than uh, a couple of dozen milliseconds. Dozen, hundred. I think it's somewhere around a hundred milliseconds. That's tiny. The the amount of uh, the 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 effort, the latencies that your backend components can contribute to this have to be super tiny. So. Okay, we have these observations. These are kind of the, the, six, uh, com uh, the six components of, of uh, a typical one-size-fits-all database uh, query evaluation scheme that kind of add to the, the, the cost, the, the six major costs of, of uh, query evaluation. So we've kind of identified a number of different costs, a number of different uh, ways of approaching each of them. Now, how do we actually approach them? Now, one, so th this is kind of the, the low end of the spectrum. Now, can we get a sense of what the high end of the spectrum is? Well. Okay, so first off, we're going to have to have some sort of distribution. We're going to have to take our data, spread it, uh, spread it out across multiple physical nodes. That, that much is, is pretty much a given if you want to scale up. So how much can we, how, how far can we go with that? And the, the in 2002, there was a, sorry, in 2000, this is a typo here. In 2000, uh, there was a paper that called uh, Towards Robust Distributed Systems that identified um, kind of one very significant limitation in uh, distributed systems. And the observation was uh, that you could get consistency, you could get availability, or you could get partition tolerance. 
uh, pick any two of the above. Um, and this has been kind of, one of again, one of the, the main rallying cries of uh, the NoSQL movement. So what do each of those terms mean? Now we've discussed consistency. Uh, kind of the, the basic observation is that if you have two different nodes participating in this system, they should be able to uh, provide you the same value. If I ask node A for the value of an object, it tells me five, I should get uh, the same value from the other node. Availability says that, well, if one of my nodes gets eaten by a dinosaur, the other one shouldn't be affected. I should be able to uh, continually ask for data values, and no matter what happens in the overall system, uh, I should be able to get back, uh, get responses. And partition tolerance, well, if the connectivity between nodes fails, if uh, one node goes down or one node loses its, net, loses its network or basically anything happen, any kind of failure happens in the overall system, I should be able to uh, react in some way. Now I use the term react here uh, because, well, this is kind of one of those things that you can't avoid. Um, you you kind of have to have partition tolerance because no matter what happens, if the network goes down, you're going to re the software is going to react in some way. So it's not really a question of uh, does the node have the ability to tolerate partitions. Uh, it's more a question of how does a, uh, how does a node react to a partition occurring, and you know, kind of the the two uh, possible solutions to that are that either the system stops providing consistent results or the system simply stops responding. I give up consistency, I give up uh, partition uh, availability. All right, so uh, any questions up to this point? Cap the uh, six principles of uh, what's wrong with one size fits all databases? Mm -hmm. That is a great question. Um, so, kind of the, the case that Stonebreaker makes, is, uh, so the question is, why don't we simply have configuration knobs somewhere in, the, uh, the no, uh, in our one-size-fits-all database that allow us to turn off these individual components, these indiv individual features? And that, like I said, is, is a great question. And the observation that Stonebreaker makes is that by picking by, by providing these individual knobs, you're creating a huge space of possible optimization decisions. So if I turn off, so I, I have, let's say, two knobs, logging and, uh, uh, I don't know, um, two-phase commit, logging and two-phase commit. How many different databases or database uh, configurations could I potentially create with those two knobs? Four. And in general, as I add knobs, how many different configurations can I create? Square or if I have three, how many three binary decisions? Two. The, yeah. So the number of different configurations I can create starts becoming exponential. And what's important to note is that the way that these knobs interact is not always intuitive. Um, if I turn off logging and two-phase commit, I may end up with kind of nodes dying and then coming back up with an inconsistent state because they haven't committed themselves properly. And there's, as I add more and more knobs, it starts becoming harder and harder to predict exactly how the database will behave. And so, again, the observation is that you want to provide a set of core tools, each tool providing sort of a subset of the functionality that you might be interested in, 
Here's a uh, two-phase commit implementation. Here's a write-ahead logging implementation. And kind of let uh, developers piece these pieces together. Really what it all boils down to is what level of abstraction do you present to the person using the database? And so a lot of the systems we'll talk about towards the end today are basically going to be different groupings of these knobs. And they're going to be highly optimized for that particular setting of those knobs. Now, just to be clear, Oracle does, Oracle, SQL Server, all of these databases do have the knobs that you're describing. But picking out which knobs are the correct ones to adjust, picking out which things uh, are, are Basically, tuning them requires essentially a full uh, DBA is a full profession. And part of that is knowing kind of the, the, the magical knobs that you adjust to turn, uh, to optimize the database for different specific cases. And even then, just having support for certain features kind of requires you to adjust how those, the, the database is designed. Does that address your concern? Any other questions? Yeah. And what kind of, uh, so the, the question is, can you use some sort of low latency network in your uh, in your data center. So what kind of, how low are, uh, a latency are we talking about? Hundreds of microseconds. And how expensive is that? And, no, expensive in terms of dollars. It gets, InfiniBand gets very, very pricey. Um, so, uh, the, again, the question is, uh, why not just create this very, very uh, high bandwidth, high, uh, low latency interconnect between your different physical nodes? Uh, and the two responses I'm going to give to that are, uh, well, the three responses are, yes, you could potentially do that. You could th start throwing money at the problem and get to a uh, extremely low latency solution that is quite efficient. And in fact, that's what mo most of Oracle's offerings at the moment are. Give us X dollars where X is however high you want it to be, and we will give you some level of performance. Um, so, yes. But the, the kind of caveat there is that the amount, you, you get diminishing returns. As you keep throwing more and more money at it, uh, you start running into problems like speed of light. I can only pack so many devices into a, a, into a rack. I can only pack so many devices into a row of server racks. And as you start kind of making your data center bigger and bigger, speed of light between two arbitrary nodes starts becoming, uh, basically, the, the, it becomes getting the, the kind of latencies that you want at the uh, scales that you're looking for becomes literally uh, a violation of, of the laws of physics. Um, So let's see. Uh, so there's physical limitations, monetary limitations, and uh, yeah, uh, basically it's just and keep in mind this is one of the one of the several pro uh, one of the six problems that I mentioned. Um, so. So like I said, uh, Oracle, if, if you buy, you, you can basically get as, as arbitrarily large a server from Oracle as, as you want, assuming that you're willing to throw enough money at them. And they do actually kind of scale up to a certain level. But at some point, it just becomes either financially or physically 
uh, impossible to get the kind of performance that you want at the scales that you want. And the latency eventually ends up kind of creeping in. Does that address your concern? Any other questions? All right, so two papers so far. Uh, all right, so we've seen a number of problems uh, with traditional one-size-fits-all databases. We've seen this cap theorem business. Now, what other kinds of considerations are there? So if, if I sat down right now to design a database, what would I need to look at? So the first thing is pretty much the first thing that we discussed in this class. How do you represent your data? And there's a number of different ways of doing that. We have the relational model that we've been working on uh, in this class. But there's also a couple of other common uh, interfaces. Uh, key value, so I, here's a, a, I give the database a key, the database gives me back a value pertaining to that key. Um, another common one is a document, or uh, another way of referring to that is a hierarchical, uh, hierarchical data model. It looks kind of like a file system. Uh, JSON and XML are both examples. Uh, JSON databases and XML databases are both examples of this. Graph data, how are things connected on a, in a social network? There's also notions of semi-structured data. Um, MapReduce uh, uses, well, actually, no, that's not right. Um, again, JSON and XML are both examples of uh, semi-structured data. So, OK, we have our data. Now, how do we want to ask questions about it? What kind of questions do we want to ask about that data? Well, maybe I just want to store the data. I just, I just want a system that can uh, hold the data for me. I want to take care of all of the query processing on my own. So there's, there's this idea, or this term, uh, CRUD, or Create, Read, Update, Delete. Um, maybe I want something a little bit more efficient in some dimension. I want filters. I want some ability to scan through the data in some particular order. Maybe I want a fully fledged query language. Another one uh, that is, uh, I'm sure many of you have heard of uh, something called MapReduce. Uh, I'll go into that a little bit. OK, so I have, uh, from a design perspective, I'm, I'm sitting down, I'm, I'm deciding how to build a database. First question is data model. Second question is query model. Third question I want to ask is, how durable do I want the data to be? Am I OK with the data just being around until the system dies? Am I OK with uh, the data just being kind of stored in memory? Maybe if I'm doing a huge amount of replication, I'm OK with having everything in memory. Because if one system dies, another one will be able to take it over. Uh, we'll still have all of that data. So what else do we want to know? Well, what kind of consistency are we going for? Do we want, do we care about consistency? If you're Facebook, maybe you, know, you, you don't really care uh, whether some, or uh, better yet, if you're uh, doing like a shopping cart or something, maybe you don't necessarily care if the shopping cart uh, kind of ends up with a couple of different, uh, someone clicks on add to shopping cart and they get an error that says, I'm sorry, this request can't be completed. You want eventual consistency? You know, maybe you're, uh, you're Facebook, you can uh, tolerate someone not getting a status update uh, at quite the moment that they request it. Or do you need strong consistency if you're, let's say, a bank? Or better yet, if you're doing financial transactions? So what kind of consistency do I want? Now, distribution is kind of going to be a given. Uh, as you're scaling up, you need more and more storage, if nothing else. But how do you distribute? 
Do you distribute through uh, by partitioning your data? Do you distribute by replication? Uh, we talked about a, d a couple of different uh, kind of protocol or not protocols um, uh, design patterns for uh, for replication strategies: uh, master slave, uh, peer to peer. How are you going to be distributing your data? And that's a, that kind of question is. All of these questions are really related. Now, another thing that people often gloss over uh, because it's not really uh, pure uh, conceptual thing, still super important, is how are you going to be managing this infrastructure? And that's kind of one of the reasons that uh, MapReduce, which is uh, ask any database person, they're going to tell you MapReduce is a horrible, 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 horrible idea. And um, but at the same time, why do people? Why do so many people use it? This is the reason. Um, it has a really easy to use uh, management interface. You start uh, all of the the messy code for starting new nodes, connecting new nodes to the infrastructure. All of that's written. All of that's there. Um, so, kind of the the. This is an important part of any distributed system. How do you manage the, the thousands or uh, hundreds of thousands of nodes that are going to be participating in that infrastructure? And then finally, uh, there are questions of workloads. So what kind of workloads are you targeting? Uh, are you targeting workloads where you're going to be reading a lot? Are you targeting workloads where you're going to be uh, writing a lot? Remember, we uh, talked about indexing. You build an index. You're making reads more efficient, but that's coming at the cost of making writes less efficient. What kind of data scale are you talking about? If you're talking about gigabytes, you might even be, a be able to get away with a single node. Or just replicating a single node a bunch of times. Get uh, servers these days with 128, 256 gigabytes of RAM. That'll fit a gigabyte database. A couple of gigabyte database will fit in memory, and that's, uh, I believe, Walmart uh, takes up a couple of, like all of Walmart maybe ten years ago took up a couple of uh, gigabytes. Now that's probably no longer the case, but a lot of a lot can be solved at that level. Terabytes again, you might be able to get away with a small, a relatively small number of nodes. And kind of the, the scale of the data that you're working with really factors into what kind of uh, systems you're going to be using, what kind of protocols, what kind of uh, techniques you think you can get away with. And fi then finally, latency. So if I'm OK with uh, hour-long uh, response times for my queries, maybe if I'm dealing with petabytes of data, again, that really decides what kind of system you uh, want to build around. OK, so it is uh, 5.40. Let's take a quick five-minute break uh, before getting into uh, some of the concepts uh, that will be involved uh, that are involved in NoSQL. So uh, be back here at 5.46. All righty. So before I continue, are there any uh, questions on uh, anything I've covered so far? All right, so let's uh, let's move on. Uh, so we've covered kind of some of the the questions that go into the design of a NoSQL system. Now I'd like to bring up a couple of concepts. Now these concepts don't directly relate to uh, NoSQL itself, but uh, many of them are kind of principles or ideas or, or techniques that come up in the use of NoSQL systems. So I kind of felt like I. Uh, well, they, they kind of belong in a NoSQL lecture. And the first of these is MapReduce. So MapReduce is probably the most uh, closely related. Um, so what is MapReduce? Well, to answer that, let me go back a couple of decades. Um, so 
people have kind of been working on set theory and uh, basically the same kind of uh, mathematical concepts that went into uh, relational databases slowly made their way into uh, programming language design. And in particular, uh, programming languages adopt, uh, particular functional languages, adopted a couple of different uh, basic operators on sets, uh, three of which uh, were identified as being particularly useful for data processing by uh, some folks at Google back in the early 2000s. Uh, and these operations are map, reduce, and sort. Now, uh, map, sorry, uh, sorry, map, sort, and flatten. Now these uh, three operations have kind of gotten renamed a little bit, uh, but essentially they, they form kind of the core of uh, any implementation of this map reduce idea. What does that mean? Well, so a MapReduce, any kind of system that implements this MapReduce paradigm, basically consists of an interface that allows you, allows you to define uh, two types of function. A map function that takes one element of a set and maps it to uh, another set element you can think of a, uh, this as kind of a, a projection operator, if you will. And a reduce function that takes a uh, group of elements and smooshes them all together. Now I'm generalizing a little bit here. Uh, a map can typically output many tuples for uh, a given input or even no tuples for a given input. And a reducer doesn't necessarily have to smush the, the, the grouped values together. But the basic premise is this, that you uh, define a function that looks at one tuple at a time and produces some set of outputs. And a reduce function that takes a group of tuples and uh, kind of looks at all of them in one go and produces some output for that. And uh, between these two functions, you express your entire computation, or at least one stage of an entire computation. And this kind of boils down into a three-stage process. Uh, the map function defines, uh, kind of identifies which group a given tuple belongs to in, ad in addition to producing output. The shuffle phase then groups everything together. And then finally, the reduce phase smooshes everything together again, according to some user-defined function. Now, what do these uh, uh, two different functions remind you of? I already told you projection for map. What about reduce? Aggregate, yes. So this is kind of like project slash select, sort, and then aggregate. Now, this paradigm is very amenable to distribution because it, you can take, because each map operator gets applied to one tuple at a time, you can distribute that very easily. So conceptually or logically, each map operation should be independent. And if that's the case, then I can take each map operation and kind of place it on a different logical node. Now, obviously, I'm not going to have one logical node for every single tuple, but I can group. That means I can group things arbitrarily. Now, shuffle is not something that's quite as easy, easy to parallelize, but at the same time, it's something that's not dependent on user-provided code. It's the same every single time, and we've talked about different ways of doing sorts or partitioning uh, according in a distributed manner. So that's something you can potentially parallelize as well. And finally, the reduce phase, uh, again, conceptually, you only need one uh, execution of the reduce task, or the, this reduce function, for every single group. So again, ev I only need one logical node uh, for every single group. So again, I can partition this pretty much as arbitrary, pretty much arbitrarily. So because this is so amenable to partitioning and distribution, it makes sense to kind of define one infrastructure for all of it. Um, you have this common interface, 
you give me a map function and a reduce function, and I'll run this whole thing for you. And kind of all of this gets built into a common infrastructure. So that's kind of the whirlwind tour of MapReduce. Um, any questions? Great. Yes? Think of it as an external sort or a partitioning operator. Uh, the shuffle phase, the map phase assigns a group to every single tuple that it outputs, and the shuffle phase essentially groups them together. Uh, it can do this by sorting them, or it can do this by simply partitioning the groups into, uh, to wherever they'll get processed in the next phase. Does that address your, question, your question? Any other questions? All right. So the next thing I want to bring up is uh, mostly terminology. Uh, this is not really so much a deep concept as it is a, uh, a pair of terms that you'll encounter and that I can't really leave you without defining. REST and CRUD. Uh, REST means represent representational state transfer. It's uh, a bit of a mouthful, but basically what it means is uh, absolutely nothing. Um, so long story short, it basically means you access the database through HTTP. Now there's a whole bunch of definitions for this, a whole bunch of kind of precise uh, characterizations of what REST or a RESTful interface means. 90% of the time when someone uses that term, what they're talking about is you can access the database through the HTT, through the HTT protocol, HTTP. Um, kind of slightly more in-depth version of that is that every single resource that is anywhere in the system has a unique identifier, um, most commonly a URI or a URL. Uh, and given a URI, the concept of a RESTful interface is that given a URI, you can uh, take that URI and uh, create an object, uh, update an object, read the object, or delete the object. So kind of the more meaningful version of this is CRUD, uh, create, read, update, delete, uh, which is basically a set of operations that you might want to apply to a given object. And it, a CRUD interface basically means that you have uh, the ability to kind of read and write the object, but not actually do any kind of querying or, or data processing on the object. Most NoSQL interfaces, or every single database, or pretty much everything, is going to expose, at a minimum, this kind of CRUD interface. And most of them are distinguished by what kind of functionality they add on top of it. So any questions on these? This is kind of a, not much in terms of deep philosophy, but. So when you encounter these two uh, terms, um, like I said, the, the, the most common uh, implementation of uh, a RESTful interface is through HTTP. Um, so I've got a little example of a, an interaction through one of these protocols right here. Uh, so Telnet is basically just a way of uh, connecting to a raw socket. There's a couple of extra features on top of it for uh, interactivity. But basically, it's just a way that I can connect to a raw socket. And so uh, if I type this to the server, it's going to give me back this. This is a typical HTTP interface. Now, let me break down that uh, thing that I typed a little bit more. So I typed get space slash space HTTP 1.0. Uh, the meaning of this is, uh, or the, the, the way that breaks down, is verb, URI, and then protocol. And protocol is pretty much always the same, HTTP 1, HTTP 1.1, something like that. The two interesting bits here are the verb and the URI. Uh, the verb is, well, something that I want to do to the URI. Uh, it 
basically says, I would like to perform some action on the following URI. Get. I would like to read the following URI. There's some facility for providing headers or kind of these key value pairs associated with the request. Most often, uh, if we go back to that example, these are things like uh, the size of the data, uh, the type of the data, or kind of metadata about the server that's serving the request. Or in this case, the client that's making the request. And there's also a space for a body of the request, which basically is kind of the, the content. So if I'm writing an object, that's the body is where I would put the, the thing that I'm writing. What kind of verbs are there? Well, the verb can be literally whatever you want. Um, the, the only thing that cares about what that verb is, is the server. And if you're writing the server, the server can be whatever you want. However, that said, there are some common verbs that you'll encounter. Uh, post, get, put, and delete. And these kind of correspond to the four uh, letters of CRUD. Um, post means I would like to write, uh, create a new value. Get means I would like to uh, read a value. Put typically refers to appending to a list or uh, adding a new element to a set. And this is kind of like update the set and delete like to delete a value. Uh, another thing I don't want to leave you without uh, at least briefly mentioning is this handy dandy command line utility called curl. And anytime you encounter something related to NoSQL or anytime you'll, you encounter something uh, related to a RESTful interface, someone will bring this up. Uh, it is a handy dandy command line utility that interacts with an HTTP server. Well, FTP servers as well, but um, it basically, the, the basic use case, curl and then a URL will read that URL and dump it to the command line. But you can do slightly more complex things. And in fact, if you do a, uh, if you look at the man page for curl, um, there is a, like, th this is one of the longest man pages I've ever seen. Uh, it has, it does, this is the Swiss army knife of RESTful inter interfaces. Um, but kind of the, the two most uh, immediate things that you might want to do with it are send a different type of verb. So you da curl dash x verb and then a URL uh, sends the appropriate verb. And curl dash d sends some data. So uh, this would put uh, hi in the body of uh, that particular request and send it as a post. Any questions? All right, this wasn't really a syntactically uh, or a semantically meaningful portion, but uh, it conveys some syntax that might be useful. All right, so the last thing I want to get into is some example systems. Now, uh, kind of my motivation for this uh, section of the talk is a book called Seven Databases in Seven Weeks. It's a really nice book, and there was a guy uh, giving, a, giving a talk on it here about a, oh, a little while ago. Uh, I think he's also going to be making another presentation later in uh, at one of the database seminars. Um, basically, the idea is uh, the idea of the book is you can kind of learn one database a week for seven day uh, for seven weeks. Uh, I am going to take six of the databases covered in that book and kind of give you some uh, some strengths and weaknesses of each, uh, and then. Also adding Hadoop because, well, that's, it's pretty common. So let's get into it. Hadoop. This is kind of the, the starting point for a lot of the uh, NoSQL movement. It started from this paper uh, on a system internal to Google called MapReduce. Uh, Yahoo decided, hey, we can do that too. And you'll see that's a kind of a recurring theme with most of these. Google does it, or Amazon does it, and then some other guys come along and say, hey, we can do that too. And then they release an open source port. Um, so Hadoop is an open source port of uh, something that uh, Google calls MapReduce. The name MapReduce kind of stuck. And it is a way to process essentially these big lists of unsorted blobs. We kind of discussed this MapReduce uh, map paradigm. Uh, 
Uh, that's basically what's going on here. Uh, the set of unorganized record blobs, and I run MapReduce tasks on them, and really that's, that's all there is to it. Um, it's designed to kind of scale out very gracefully, bring it to a very large sized uh, amount, large amount of data, uh, but that comes at a price. Uh, it tries to do everything. Uh, there's well, not really any notion of data updates, so it doesn't manipulate data in any way, but just the, the it does things in kind of the most generic way possible. So often queries in this setting are going to take hours, minutes if not hours, or more. But at the same time, this is kind of the epitome of big data processing. So, or at least what was uh, kind of going out of fashion a little bit. Um, several Apache projects have uh, announced, there's a news article like two, three days ago that several Apache projects are no longer uh, accepting updates to, uh, that kind of involve MapReduce. So uh, yeah, this is kind of the, the starting point. Another uh, major system, uh, no, no SQL system out there, is called uh, REOC. REOC is, uh, again, starts from a system out of uh, Amazon called Dynamo, and basically that got published. There's some documentation of how that works. So a bunch of people came around and said, hey, we can do that, and so they wrote it. And now that's called REOC. So the basic data model here is that uh, you have key value pairs. You give it a key, it gives you back a value. And the basic interaction with REOC is through these kind of CRUD operations. I ask for a key, it gives me back the value. Now, the kind of main, the, there are two main gimmicks uh, behind REOC, both of which are pretty cool. Uh, so the first, and this is kind of where it uh, connects to Dynamo, is this idea that the consistency can be kind of controlled. Actually, sorry, there are three gimmicks that are really cool. And the first is this idea that consistency can be controlled on a per request basis. So uh, every time you make a request to a REOC system, you can tell it what level of replication you care about, what level of replication consistency you care about. You give it a, a number, and then it makes sure that the data has been successfully replicated to however many nodes you request. And similarly, if you perform a read, you can tell it, I would like a value that at least three nodes agree on. And then it will consult three nodes and make sure that they all agree on the value that they return to you. So the first thing is that it has this per request consistency model. The, th the second thing is that the requests actually give you some version history. So I'm sure by now uh, all of you have encountered a git conflict, right? Yeah. Um, it basically has that, uh, it, it does that. So anytime you do a read in REOC, it has the poten one potential response that you can get back from it is these are the two most recent versions. I have no idea which of them is the most recent. And then it's up to the end user to kind of, de or the, the program running on top of React to kind of decide how to merge those two updates together. It doesn't try and merge them together, it relies on the, the end user to do that. And the last thing, and this I found really, really cool, you can establish links between different keys. So on top of this key value store, it also has uh, something that is tantamount to a graph database, uh, where keys can be linked together, and you can issue queries or graph queries over these links. Any questions so far? All right, let's move on. So another system out there uh, that I'd like to bring up uh, is called HBase. 
So once again, this is kind of connected to a handful of different systems out there. Uh, Cassandra and uh, kind of the initial inspiring uh, system for all of this was a system out of Google called Bigtable. Now, uh, HBase is this, uh, it is relational, and I use that term in quotes, uh, it is a relational uh, key value store. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that in HBase, uh, you still have this notion of tables, and every table has rows, and there are columns, but there's some facility for the, the schema of these tables changing over time, at least within some uh, limited constraints. So HBase and pretty much all of the, the big table descendants have this idea of column families. Now, a column family is kind of like a regular column in a relational table, but the difference is that the values that get stored inside a column family are uh, unstructured key value mappings. What do I mean by that? Let me show you an example here. Um, a column family, I could have, for example, a column family uh, called shape, and in one row have the mapping shape, uh, sorry, square is four, and in another row have a separate mapping triangle is four and uh, three, and square is four. So essentially, a specific value gets identified by a table name, then a row identifier, then a column family, and within the column family, a specific uh, column name. The, the advantage of this is that the set of column families is fixed, just like in a traditional relational database. But within a column family, you can create and destroy uh, columns on a row-by-row -row basis. So uh, an individual row can have whatever set of columns uh, are relevant for that particular uh, instance of the row. The, column, the individual columns are unstructured, but the column families are structured. Any questions? All right, so HBase is built on top of uh, Hadoop and the HDFS, um, the Hadoop file system, and kind of shares a lot of the same trade-offs. So uh, HBase require, um, typically is targeted at really, really big data, petabytes if not more. And the latencies that you can expect to see are typically very, very high. All right, moving on. Uh, any questions so far? All right. Yes? Oh, sure. Uh, so a very common example for this is um, advertising and analytics. So. In analytics, I have these very, wi these very wide um, relations. Oh, uh, in case I didn't, uh, I didn't mention it, I'm sorry about that. HBase is uh, what's known as a column, st uh, is a column store. Um, it's implemented not quite in the same way, but basically it's a column store. Um, that feeds into this answer because you have these very wide relations in analytics. Um, I might have some information about a uh, user's uh, interest in sports, and I might have some interest, uh, some uh, information about a user's, uh, let's say, age, uh, various characteristics, but I might not have all of that information for a given user. So I might know that a user is interested in uh, baseball and football, but not soccer, or uh, baseball and American football, base, uh, and, and not uh, British or European football. Non-American football. Um, those are three different attributes of a given person. And if I have one row for every person, then those three attributes are things that I might associate with a column family. They're both sports interests. So if I would like to do a query over the sports interests of a given person, I can kind of extract just the, the relevant columns 
uh, for that specific query. But at the same time, if I don't have information about a given interest, um, baseball, uh, I can kind of store that by just not having a record for baseball true, baseball false. Um, does that address your, your question? Yes, uh, for some definite, well, uh, semi-structured in this case, meaning that the structure is entirely in the column families. And the, the column families you can think of as being um, dense data. So the, uh, every single row has some entry in, in the column, in every single column family, whereas the data in the column families themselves, the columns are sparse. So you, you only define the columns that are specifically relevant to a given row. So yeah, it's, it's semi-structured, um, and the semi basically is, is this, uh, you don't have to define all of the columns. Uh, one thing I would distinguish though is there is some level of hierarchy in here, but the hierarchy is fixed. So this is not a typical JSON object because a typical JSON object can go as, you, you can have as much nesting as you want, uh, an object within an object within an object within an object. Okay, um, so, any other questions? All right. Uh, another one is CouchDB. So CouchDB has this, uh, is probably the closest thing to a key value store or a pure uh, key value store that, or one of the two. Um, it uses JSON as kind of its data representation. And this is something that you kind of see in a number of these NoSQL uh, stores. Kind of the, there's this notion of keys that identify certain objects in the system. And if you have a key, you can kind of access that object. But then there's some structure to the value as well. That's an important trade-off uh, between an unstructured value and having a, a value that has some level of structure to it. Because if the database knows what that value, how that value is structured, it has the ability to manipulate that value in place. So if I have an object that takes up 10 megabytes, let's say um, an image and some associated metadata, if I want to change the metadata, I don't want to have to re-upload the entire object uh, from scratch. That means I need some structure. I need to be able to distinguish the data that goes into the image from the data that goes into the, the metadata, or the, the chunks of the big blob of, of bits that represent each of those. And so what this guy does uh, is it represents all of that as JSON, allows you to manipulate those uh, individual values as JSON, uh, and kind of the, the primitive interface uh, for everything is, again, this, this kind of create uh, read, update, delete. The one gimmick that it has is, the, or there are two gimmicks here. Uh, the first is that you can define views using MapReduce. So you have these, uh, define these little bits of code, uh, map task and reduce task, and that translates, uh, that creates these uh, representations of the data for you that you can then create, read, uh, then, that you can then read from. Uh, the other gimmick of CouchDB is how it implements consistency. So the way that it does consistency is by uh, using test and set. What do I mean by that? So every object has a version associated with it. Now recall in Reoc, the way that consistency was handled was that if you did a read, you might get multiple versions of the object because you might have multiple recent versions. In the case of CouchDB, what happens is that when you do a write, you need to provide the previous version of that object. And if the, the previous version doesn't match up with what the database sees, then that write simply isn't allowed. It errors. So what kind of workloads uh, is this likely to be focused on? Then 
Yeah, so basically systems, uh, settings where you have rights to individual objects coming from individual threads. Or alternatively, read heavy workloads. And kind of the, obviously the downside is that you, you might end up with a lot of failures if you try and use this for concurrent writes. All right, uh, two more. Um, so Neo4j is a graph database. And, you know, there's a bajillion of these out there. Um, the basic kind of underlying data representation is a graph, um, a, a set of nodes and a set of edges connecting those. You can uh, query individual nodes, create, read, update, delete individual nodes, uh, or you can kind of uh, define pieces of code that traverse the edges. Uh, what are called, well, kind of like a visitor pattern, but in this case, what's getting visited is the, the individual nodes. Uh, it uses eventual consistency. Uh, kind of the, the main reason that I have it here is just it's an example of a graph database. And like I said, there's a bajillion of these out there. Uh, Redis is another example of uh, is another example of a almost pure key value store. Uh, now Redis's kind of origins are that it was kind of a cache replacement. The, what do I mean by cache replacement? Um, so originally Redis was not meant as a database per se. It was meant as a place that you could put temporary values. Uh, cache them. Uh, for example, if you run a query on a different database, you could potentially temporarily store it in Redis uh, so that the next time you ran that same query, you'd have it already pre-computed. Um, what kind of, it's since grown a bit and uh, has gotten some limited, abil uh, limited uh, support for durability. Um, so in a typical cache, obviously, you don't necessarily need to uh, store things back to disk. Um, in a typical database, you do want some, some amount of durability. And so Redis has uh, some limited ability to do snapshotting or uh, write-ahead logging as well um, for persistence. And both of those are kind of done uh, in the background. It's still kind of... Uh, has very, very weak durability uh, assertions or durability properties. Um, kind of the, the neat thing about this is that it, the, the values have a limited amount of structure, but they have kind of a very fixed set of uh, structures that they can take. So a value, uh, in addition to being kind of the, just a raw binary blob, uh, can be potentially a hash or a mapping from keys to values, uh, a list or, well, a list of values, a uh, queue, a set, or a sorted set. Um, and basically each of these allow uh, some level of manipulation on the internal structure of the object uh, without necessarily becoming so complex that the, uh, the system can no longer uh, manage it efficiently. All right, so any questions? All right, so a couple things i like to leave you with. Um, some resources, uh, basically the three things that I cited in today's lecture. Uh, the End of an Architectural Era by Michael Stonebreaker, uh, Towards Ro Robust Distributed Systems by Eric Brewer, and Seven Databases in Seven Weeks uh, by Redmond. And with that, all right. Uh, thanks a lot, and see everyone on next Monday.